So uh, today I'll be talking about um, uh, large scale structure and measurements of large scale structure using a new, a relatively new technique, 21 centimeter intensity mapping, um, and what we can learn about cosmology from those measurements. So uh, Brian Green uh, said this uh, somewhat dramatically, but uh, noted that we as humans are storytellers and what could be more grand than the story of creation. Uh, so certainly um, many people could take issue with this and, and say that uh, particular branches of science are more interesting than cosmology, uh, but cosmologists definitely have an interesting story to tell. So uh, we know the universe started off with a big bang um, about 14 billion years ago. Uh, we believe it went through a period of rapid expansion um, in uh, which we call inflation, where it expanded over 25 orders of magnitude in the space of much less than a second. Um, after that, the universe expanded at a more lackadaisical rate, um, eventually forming neutral hydrogen and then releasing the cosmic microwave background, uh, which we, of course, measure again today. After that, the universe was largely neutral hydrogen until the first stars galaxies, et cetera, and black holes began to form um, that ionized uh, that neutral hydrogen and made it all go away. Um, and then uh, uh, the structure formation of the universe continued over the next 13 or so billion years, um, forming clusters of galaxies and, uh, and uh, uh, larger structure uh, over time. Um, finally, uh, about maybe 4 billion years ago or so, uh, the expansion rate of the universe began to accelerate, something which we attribute to dark energy. So uh, from this uh, figure, you would think that we had figured it all out. Uh, we basically knew everything about the universe and we can all uh, go home and stop worrying about it. Uh, but of course, if you take a cosmologist out for beer and ask us a few more questions about this, uh, you, you might get a different answer. Um, so you, uh, we would say that this period of rapid expansion that we call inflation, um, there's no unique evidence right now to support that theory. So uh, we don't, we can't say definitively that this, uh, that uh, this inflation actually happened. Um, this period when the universe was largely neutral hydrogen and the first uh, objects began to form, we know very little about that period, what those objects were, um, and how, uh, how that proceeded. Uh, we don't know what those first objects were, so these first stars, uh, we're not sure what they are. Um, most astronomers will tell you this stuff, the development in galaxies and planets, is also a pretty big question mark, so uh, we don't know a lot about that either. There's a lot of room for, uh, for learning new things. And then finally, this period of rapid expansion, uh, this period of expansion that um, started to accelerate about four billion years ago, uh, we don't really know the underlying cause of that either. So there's actually uh, many holes in our knowledge um, uh, uh, in this picture. So I am an experimentalist. So of course I am interested in what we can measure to help us answer some of these questions. Um, I'm gonna focus largely on this last question uh, in this talk, um, what we can learn about dark energy in our current um, accelerated expansion of the universe um, through different measurements. Um, so one set of measurements that I'm not gonna have a chance to talk about are measurements of the cosmic microwave background with two experiments, uh, Simon's Observatory and CMB stage four. Um, I will mostly be focusing on what we can learn about the expansion of the universe through measurements of large-scale structure, so through the distribution of galaxies um, uh, across cosmic time. Um, and specifically with uh, the 21 centimeter experiments, CHIME and Hyrax. So I made these two things sound very separate. Uh, so we have the cosmic microwave background that was formed about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. We see it today as a radiation pattern and we measure it uh, with all of our wonderful CMB telescopes. Um, and then there's also uh, the distribution of galaxies in the sky from more uh, recent measurements and galaxy surveys. I mean, it turns out uh, there's a fundamental scale that lives in both of those signatures. So 
if you uh, measure the CMB and find, say, all of the hot spots or all of the cold spots and stack them on top of each other, um, you'll end up with a sort of ring-like feature around uh, around a given hot spot or cold around a sum of hot spots and cold spots. Uh, you'd find the same thing in a galaxy survey as well, um, and that's not a coincidence. So that there's a fundamental scale that lives in both of those uh, signals. That is what we're going to exploit to understand the expansion history of the universe. Um, for cosmologists, this is not a surprise. They already know about this. Uh, but for other people, uh, this might sound a little weird. Some um, a uh, signal that was made 400,000 years after the Big Bang somehow magically shows up again in the distribution of galaxies in the sky today. So how did how did that work? Um, so it's pretty straightforward, but we have to cast our minds back to about 400,000 years after the Big Bang to understand where it came from. Um, so back then, the universe uh, didn't have stars, didn't have galaxies. Uh, it was just a, a coupled photon baryon fluid. Um, so uh, it was basically just constituent particles that were coupled together um, through Thomson scattering. So uh, uh, we are going to, and, in that universe, there were small overdense regions uh, scattered throughout the universe. These overdense regions uh, would seed pressure waves that would propagate out through this coupled fluid. And so we're going to watch uh, one of these pressure waves propagate through, uh, through this coupled fluid. And uh, specifically, we're going to watch it in baryons. So largely, you should view this as electrons um, and in photons. Um, so uh, we're going to watch it in physical space uh, on the two uh, left-hand panels. And then you can also do sort of a radial profile if you just picked the center and then summed in, a, in annuli around it, uh, sort of how much, how many baryons and how many photons do you get? So that's the radial profile on the right-hand side. Um, so we're going to start universe less than 400,000 years old. Um, a pressure wave just began to propagate outwards from its little central region. Uh, and we can see that the baryons and the photons look the same. Um, and we can check that in this radial profile. Um, and that's because, of course, this fluid is coupled together. So you would expect these two, um, uh, these two types of particles to look the same. Um, so we're going to watch this pressure wave propagate outwards from its little central overdense region. So some time later, but the universe is still less than 400,000 years old. Um, the, the pressure wave has propagated outwards a little bit. Um, the baryons and photons are still coupled together. So these two pictures look identical. And again, we can check that in the radial profile. It looks the same. Um, so we expect that. And then something interesting happened when the universe was about 400,000 years old. So at this point, the universe had expanded and cooled just enough to start forming neutral hydrogen that decoupled the photons from the electrons. Um, and so now uh, this pressure wave um, looks uh, uh, um, looks like the other pressure wave um, from earlier in baryon density, but the photons are starting to uh, sort of free stream away from this, uh, from this uh, pressure wave system. And you can see that in the radial profile as the baryons are beginning to, uh, uh, the photons are beginning to sort of move, move away from this, uh, this, uh, uh, this pressure wave. Um, that gets worse as time goes on and the photons free stream even more away. Um, but the baryons are sort of, in some sense, captured. Uh, this pressure wave stalls because it's no longer supported by those photons. So it just kind of hangs out there um, until those baryons begin uh, falling back towards the central overdense region that they started from. Um, so again, there's still a bunch of, there's still an overdensity there. So some of the baryons are gonna, are gonna start to collect back in the middle. Um, so you can see that in the radial profile where the photons are sort of, you know, free streamed away. They're almost non-existent at this point in density, uh, but, the, but some baryons are starting to fall back again to the center. And then we can go all the way to today. The photons are gone. We'll measure them again as the cosmic microwave background. Um, but the baryons have ended up in basically two places. One is back at the center where they started. Uh, but there's a sort of remnant ring-like feature 
uh, that has um, stayed in place uh, from, uh, from this pr initial pressure wave that, that started when the universe was younger. Um, so we end up with a sort of remnant over density of baryons in the place where the pressure wave stalled. Um, so we get a collection of more baryons in these two regions, and that means ultimately a collection of more galaxies in these regions. So we would preferentially find galaxies at the center uh, where there's more baryons, and then again in a ring, sort of ring-like feature around that central place. Um, so we'll end up with more, more galaxies uh, in these, uh, again, in the center and in a ring around that center. Um, so uh, uh, you don't have to believe me, this has been measured. Um, so of course, this is a statistical statement. So we can't actually find rings in the sky, but we can look for them statistically um, using galaxy surveys. So um, this is a galaxy survey, Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, the, this picture on the left represents 300,000 galaxies um, that traces basically where all of the galaxies were um, um, out to uh, uh, red shifts of about 0.14 or so. So to look for these ring-like features, uh, you basically uh, find every galaxy in the map and then ask how many galaxies are some distance away, some uh, you know in rings around your favorite galaxy, and then do that for every single galaxy in this uh, in this survey. Um, so what you find is uh, on the right-hand side in this plot. So what you build up from doing that is what they call a correlation function, but this basically looks for, you know, basically how much, how many galaxies are some particular distance away uh, from another galaxy. And you find that there's a bump at about 100 H inverse megaparsecs or so. Um, that bump is a remnant of that ring-like feature. So this bump right here is exactly the thing uh, that we found from our little toy model uh, on the previous slide. Um, so this is a seven or so sigma result. There are um, even more impressive ones, of course, now from more recent surveys. Um, but, uh, but this is uh, showing the same sort of thing uh, that the previous slide did, which is that there's extra power at a given scale away from the uh, at, a, at a given scale. Uh, we find the same thing in the CMB, of course. Um, so you can do nearly the same thing, uh, stack up hot spots and cold spots, and then look for, uh, for how much power is some given distance away. And you'll find, uh, you'll find again, or this ring-like feature um, in the CMB as well. So this gives us a powerful probe. We have a measurement um, from the CMB that gives us a scale uh, that was set when the universe was about 400,000 years old and the CMB was formed. That same scale we will measure again in the galaxy distributions on the sky. Um, this ring-like feature expands with the universe for the galaxies, and so we can use this to understand how the universe has expanded over time um, between the CMB and whenever you were measuring those galaxies. Um, so this is a uh, special enough type of measurement that we give it a name. So these are baryon acoustic oscillations. So if I say BAO, um, you should just think uh, ring-like feature left over in the galaxy distribution. So we now have a technique for trying to understand how the universe has expanded over time, but what do we actually want to measure uh, and how do we use this to say constrain something about dark energy, uh, which of course we only see by its influence over the expansion history of the universe. So uh, so we this seems like a really excellent way to measure dark energy, but what do we actually, what parameters do we actually want to measure when we say measure dark energy? Um, so usually we're talking about measuring the equation of state. So uh, the equation of state relates the pressure of a given fluid um, or object to its density. Um, we'll make it linear. So we just put a W in front and then that W becomes our equation of state parameter. Um, we can use a combination of basically GR, uh, general relativity and our favorite cosmology metric to write down how the density of a given constituent 
um, changes as the universe expands. So that's uh, given here with this equation um, and how that depends on W, this equation of state parameter. Here A is a what we call the scale factor. So this just encodes cosmic size. Um, it's one today and was smaller in the past. Uh, so we've just kind of normalized it to be one today so that we don't have to deal with uh, actual uh, units. Um, so we can get a few examples for what these, um, uh, for, you know, what equation of state uh, means uh, for different things that at least we know about. So for example, matter has an equation of state of zero-ish. So if we put zero into this uh, equation, we'll find that the energy density of matter goes down like a to the minus three or goes down like volume. So that makes sense. Uh, if you have matter and the universe expands, you'd expect that its density would go down like volume. Radiation has an equation of state of a third. Um, this turns out to mean that its energy density goes down like a to the minus four. Uh, so it's kind of like going down like volume with an extra factor of say wavelength uh, because it's the energy density, not just the density of the photons. Um, we can also, um, uh, put in uh, another number, uh, nope. uh, we'll put in another number. Uh, we could uh, estimate a W of minus one, for example. So I can do this math. If I put a, a minus one in this equation, I'll get a constant energy density. So that's the rough equivalent of say, uh, having a particle in a box, um, doubling the size of the box and then doubling the volume of the box and then suddenly getting two particles out. Um, so uh, this would be something that you might associate with how much volume of space you have um, uh, and uh, certainly is weird and doesn't behave really anything like matter. There's an extra um, uh, uh, implication for this, which is, of course, as the universe expands, uh, the energy density of matter and radiation decreases, um, but something that has a constant energy density may eventually take over the total energy density of the universe, um, simply because it's constant. So you just draw a straight line basically here. Um, so thank God we don't have anything like that in the universe, uh, except uh, that it turns out we do. So uh, dark energy uh, currently seems like uh, you know, the, the constraints show that dark energy is equivalent to a, a roughly a constant. So it's equation of state is about minus one. Um, and we are in the scenario where it has taken over the energy, total energy density of the universe. So about 72% of our universe is made up of dark energy um, and the rest of it is dark matter and regular matter. Um, so we're dominated by dark energy uh, and it has uh, obviously kind of a strange behavior. Uh, so, uh, uh, we don't, it, it dominates the universe and we don't really have any great models for it. If you ask particle physicists, uh, they would tell you that vacuum energy is a thing that exists. So energy associated with space itself, uh, but their estimates for how, uh, how much of it you should have are about a 120 orders of magnitude larger than the actual measured value of dark energy today. So that's a, a not a great prediction basically for what we measure. Um, so we, we still end up with a fundamental mystery of what is this stuff that's dominating our energy content. Um, so the best constraint so far is, uh, is that the equation of state is consistent with minus one uh, with about seven or seven or so percent uh, error bars on it. Um, so you can actually imagine that maybe uh, uh, you could have some room for non-constant dark energy models. Um, so uh, they might be weird, but, uh, but there is wiggle room for adding in perhaps models that end up sounding more fundamental than simply sticking a constant into GR. In addition, uh, as many of you in the audience may know, um, there is a tension in Lambda CDM right now for the prediction of our local um, expansion rate, um, which we call H naught. Um, so the prediction from the CMB versus actual measurements from things like supernova uh, that show this discrepancy at a uh, uh, fairly high sigma um, between the predictions of the CMB and these more local measurements. Um, and so, 
the origin of this is right now unclear, um, but this is one of the few tensions in Lambda CDM that we've really come across in recent history. So certainly deserves thought um, and consideration. So, um, Great. So uh, what you, I'll go back to this. So what you'd like to do is um, uh, to understand whether uh, the equation of state of dark energy is actually a constant or maybe something different. Um, uh, uh, one thing that you can do, and the only thing that we really have access to on the measurement side is to measure the expansion rate of the universe as a function of time. So basically walk back on our line back in time and ask uh, how much had the universe expanded uh, at, at different um, times in the past and see if this, uh, uh, see if it's, uh, consistent with a constant or something different. Um, and that would tell you what sorts of models you may uh, be trying to think about um, for, for what dark energy can fundamentally be. So um, measurements uh, like baryon acoustic oscillation should be really good for this because you can measure galaxies at lots of different redshifts. Um, that should give you a scale at different redshifts or different points in time that allow you to understand how the universe has expanded uh, over time. And so we're not the only people to think of this. Galaxy survey people uh, really, really are interested in this question. And so we can ask how well have baryon acoustic oscillations already constrained our cosmological uh, models to be, uh, and for example, how well have they constrained um, the dark energy equation of state to be something consistent with a constant. So here um, I am plotting uh, measurements as a function of redshift. So time goes backwards, zero is today, 2.5 is in the past. Um, I have normalized some stuff. The main thing you should take away is if uh, dark energy is constant, uh, you would measure numbers that are on this flat line. Um, so each of these gray points is a galaxy survey from fairly recent data. Um, so you can see that they are certainly consistent with a line, um, uh, but that the error bars are fairly large. So you can pretty easily um, uh, uh, allow some forms of uh, um, some models that are not simply a constant, not simply uh, uh, on a, a line here. So what we would like are measurements that sort of fill in all these redshift ranges where we don't really have a lot of measurements and then have tiny little error bars so that we can figure out if we're actually on this line or if the universe was doing something a little bit different. Um, so that's what we'd like. So how do we get it? Um, well, uh, baryon acoustic oscillations, again, seem like a good way to do this. They can be measured out to high redshift. Um, you can measure galaxies out to high redshift. Um, so we have a couple options. One is do what we did before. So take a really big optical survey, make it even better, find even more galaxies, look even further in the past, and uh, try to do a really good job of uh, getting those error bars down and filling in these redshift ranges. <clears throat> so you can do that, and certainly optical surveys are doing that even now. But we can also think of a different way of making these measurements. So these baryon acoustic oscillation features are large. They're about 150 megaparsecs in radius. Um, so they contain hundreds of thousands or millions of galaxies. So I can imagine, you know, if I drew my baryon acoustic oscillation feature on this SDSS map, it might be uh, roughly like this bullseye shape. Um, so I could imagine taking that SDSS survey and just blurring it out a little bit so um, I, uh, such that I can still pick out this baryon acoustic oscillation feature, but maybe I didn't measure every individual galaxy, maybe I averaged a bunch of galaxies together. So we don't need to resolve individual galaxies to measure this BAO feature. Of these be it, you know, this BAO peak. What we do need is something that traces the dark matter distribution, so the same underlying thing that galaxies trace, and also gives us redshift information so we can figure out where we made that measurement in time uh, to chart out the whole history of the expansion. Great. Um, so, um, it turns out neutral hydrogen is a really great way to do this. So, uh, 
uh, neutral hydrogen gives off 21 centimeter photons when the um, electron uh, goes from spin aligned with the proton to spin anti-aligned with the proton. Um, and uh, neutral hydrogen is also extremely abundant. So this is a, a picture of a galaxy in uh, ionized hydrogen and then in neutral hydrogen. You can see um, there's a bunch of neutral hydrogen. It's really bright. So there's a radio, a 21 centimeter radio measurement of this galaxy. Um, so uh, neutral hydrogen is abundant in these galaxies. Um, uh, and so can be used as a tracer uh, in the same way that we use optical surveys for, uh, for tracing uh, where the galaxies are. Um, so if I wanted to build an experiment that was going to measure galaxies at high redshift, um, but using their neutral hydrogen emission instead of their optical emission, um, let's say I was interested in redshifts between, uh, say, uh, 0.8 and, and 2.5. So a redshift, uh, a 21 centimeter photon that was emitted at redshift 2.5, um, the wavelength of that light would have expanded over time. And today we would measure that as a 75 centimeter photon instead, uh, or 400 megahertz. Um, if a galaxy emitted a 21 centimeter photon at a redshift of 0.8, uh, would have uh, that that photon would have uh, would also have had its wavelength expanded um, as it redshifted, uh, uh, but wouldn't be quite as big. So we'd have a say 38 centimeter photon or so uh, uh, from a redshift of 0.8, uh, or a measurement at 800 megahertz in frequency. So if we wanted to measure uh, 21 centimeter emission between a redshift range of 0.8 and 2.5, we would build an experiment that operated between 400 to 800 megahertz. Um, there has been a detection of, um, of 21 centimeter emission in high redshift galaxies. Um, through cross correlation. So um, uh, a measurement from the radio telescope, Green Bank Telescope, um, in cross correlation with, in this case, EBOS uh, uh, and Wiggle Z, um, uh, yielded an estimate for the amount of neutral hydrogen that lived in those galaxies. Um, so what's shown here are, uh, so that's shown as these, uh, these black points at a redshift of about, uh, uh, 0.8 or so. Um, and you can see it's consistent. The, these uh, dark points are consistent with the, um, with the purple points, so known from uh, presumably Lyman alpha measurements, um, uh, uh, and, and uh, show that these galaxies certainly contain neutral hydrogen uh, and even well enough to constrain how much neutral hydrogen uh, lived in them. Um, so there is hope. Uh, galaxies at, at these redshifts certainly contain neutral hydrogen. Uh, we can at least measure it through cross correlations right now to verify that. Um, and so this is evidence that, uh, that uh, high redshift galaxies contain neutral hydrogen. And so you should be able to use uh, 21 centimeter emission as a galaxy probe. So we built an experiment to go uh, uh, under, to measure dark energy in these redshift ranges using the 21 centimeter emission from neutral hydrogen. Um, so this is CHIME, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. Um, it is a collaboration of bunches of people with four main institutions in Canada. Um, it consists of four cylinders, which are each 20 meters wide. Uh, so 20 meters in the sort of curved direction by 100 meters long. Um, so that gives us an 80 meter, uh, 80 meter by 100 meter telescope. Um, on this telescope, we have uh, over 1,000 dual polarization feeds. So that's over 2,000 channels, uh, since dual polarization means two polarizations. Uh, we operate between 400 and 800 megahertz. That gives us our redshift range of 0.8 to 2.5. Um, and we've been taking data for about three years or so now, three and a half years. Um, so we had our first light ceremony, uh, September 7th, 2017. And um, for scale, uh, this is the Canadian Minister of Science back in 2017. So you can see that this telescope is really quite large. Uh, here's one of the beams, uh, one of the curved beams for it. Um, so uh, I uh, will briefly go through the instrument itself. Uh, so uh, we, as is true for basically every telescope, there is a curved reflector. In our case, that's a cylindrical reflector. 
the light is focused up to a line that goes along those cylinders. Um, so you can see for scale about how big that focal line is. It can hold people. Um, uh, the signals are picked up by these radio feeds, these antennas. Um, that signal is amplified by a set of low noise amplifiers and then sent over a bunch of coaxial cable um, to all of our digital electronics that live in uh, RFI enclosed shipping containers. Um, so the presence of shipping containers is always how you know this is a cosmology experiment. Um, so the data from these uh, 1024 feeds is uh, digitized and channelized into a thousand frequencies. So now for every input, we have a thousand numbers um, in a 400, 800 megahertz frequency range. Um, that turns out to be a lot of data, 6.6 uh, .6 terabits per second total. So if I was going to store the data directly coming off of our digitized uh, back end, uh, if I were trying to store this on my laptop, I'd be able to get, uh, my laptop's not that powerful, but I'd be able to keep it for about half a second and then, uh, and then my laptop would be full. So uh, luckily that's not our plan for storing our data. <laughs> After that, the data gets sent to two 40-foot shipping containers filled with GPUs. Um, these do what's known as the cross correlation. So they take for every one of these thousand frequencies, they take signals from every pair of feeds and multiply them by each other. Um, so this is a radio version of, of resolution. I'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. Um, these uh, shipping containers filled with GPUs um, are uh, impressive, I have to say. Uh, we also had to move to water cooling um, to be able to handle the amount of raw power uh, in heat that these things are dumping out into the world. Um, so a lot of engineering actually had to go into uh, building this back end uh, for Chime, and it was probably more work than all of the you know reflector uh, feed LNA uh, stuff combined. So uh, at the end of the day, CHIME is a transit telescope. Um, there we go. Um, so uh, it's far too big to move. So it just sits there on the ground and we let the sky rotate overhead. So it's a transit telescope. Um, uh, it, uh, that allows us to see the entire sky every day. Uh, so we get to make a map of the sky each day. It's located in Penticton, British Columbia, which is about five hours inland of Vancouver. So it's uh, in the uh, 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 coastal mountain range. Um, so uh, time is an interferometer. The reason we have that complicated back end is to give us uh, resolution on the sky. So if I had, uh, if I did a really stupid thing and just put one single radio antenna on one single uh, chime feed, uh, one single chime reflector, uh, the beam on the sky would be a big hot dog. Uh, so it would have no resolution in the north-south direction along the cylinder, um, but it would have a little bit of resolution in the east-west direction where it's curved. So I would end up with sort of a big long hot dog shape on the sky um, above my telescope. Of course, that's not what we do. So we have a bunch of feeds. Um, if I had, say, uh, seven feeds or eight feeds on, the, on, this, uh, on this radio dish, um, when I multiply each of these pairs of feeds together, I end up with additional resolution along the north-south direction. So this is a magical, not magical, but it's a, this is an interferometric technique uh, to gain resolution by correlating signals together from, uh, from radio dishes. Um, so I would end up being able to have some resolution along my hot dog shape of my beam. And then if I added the rest of the cylinders, um, because I'm correlating each of the input pairs, in each of the inputs in pairs, I can do the same, uh, I get the same uh, um, math out where I get some additional resolution along the east-west direction from being able to combine pairs uh, between these different cylinders. So I end up with basically a, um, with a set of beams that live inside of my primary hot dog shaped beam. Um, these allow me to have uh, uh, finer resolution on the sky using these interferometric techniques um, in, in pairs of feeds by combining pairs of feeds. 
So this is how Chime gets resolution on the sky and is able to actually make maps of the sky uh, using, our, using our interferometer. <clears throat> so how well uh, do we think we can do? So again, this is the state of the art from current baryon acoustic oscillation surveys. Um, if we add our expectations uh, from Chime, um, uh, the projections from Chime alone uh, are uh, shown in red. Um, so you can see uh, maybe uh, that we fill out this redshift range between 0.8 and 2.5. Again, that's because of course our frequency range has been chosen uh, to, to fill out that redshift range. Um, and you can see that our uh, error bars are far smaller than the current uh, surveys. Um, uh, and are even commensurate in the low redshift ranges with upcoming optical experiments such as DESI, um, and then far better at high redshift and beyond where they, they don't have any sensitivity. Um, this assumes a five-year survey for CHIME. Um, and of course, we've been taking data now for about three years, three and a half years. Um, so we're, route, we're uh, coming up on that five-year survey mark. Um, so uh, we uh, make maps of the sky every day. Uh, we also combine those maps. So this is uh, uh, a map from two months of data from Chime um, at one of our thousand frequency bins. Um, so you can see a couple of uh, a couple of things about this. One is uh, this is the galaxy uh, sort of uh, falling on one side and rising on the next. Um, there's a fan region of synchrotron emission uh, in the northern part of our galaxy, and there are tons of little point sources all over the um, all over this map. Um, so we uh, can make maps of the sky. We certainly measure a reasonable radio sky from this. So this is what you would expect from Chime. Um, uh, uh, and, um, oh yeah, Are the uh, horizontal stripes, are those side lobes excited by the galaxy or are they like a pickup from uh, like stuff on the, on the ground? Yeah, this is actually crosstalk that we uh, weren't able to fully mitigate for this map. Yeah, so um, so uh, there's crosstalk between feeds along a cylinder and between feeds between feeds even across cylinders, um, and so there are uh, so you end up with these sort of um, horizontal stripey features basically running along the north south part of our beam because of that. Um, so that's because we haven't fully modeled crosstalk away yet. Yeah. Okay. And you have 18 times more data than this, right? Uh, we have uh, 1,000 times more frequency bins uh, and then uh, uh, three years of data. Yeah. I don't know if that's 18 times, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We have a lot more data than this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just looking at the time, not the number. Oh, yeah, the time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, and I should have re-highlighted this. So we make one, a map that doesn't look quite like this. It's not quite as nice as this, but uh, we make one of these maps every night uh, due to that the cylindrical shape of our dishes. Uh, so we get a map like this every single day. We use that for calibrating the instrument and many other things um, based on the, the sources that are, that are in this map. Um, so we have um, uh, we have science results from Chime. Uh, we've been on the sky for over three years. Those science results are primarily, uh, or right now, only from our fast radio burst uh, analysis backend. So I'm going to highlight just a couple of these papers <laughs> to talk about. Sorry, that's my dog. Um, uh, one is uh, one is a uh, second source of repeating fast radio bursts. So fast radio bursts are um, what they sound like, uh, radio bursts that go off in the sky and they're very fast, usually occurring over the course of a millisecond or a few. Um, uh, not much has is known about them, but less was known about them when time existed. Um, there had been one repeating burst that had been detected before this. Um, Chime found a second one uh, indicating that there were probably varieties of populations of fast radio bursts, but also indicating that um, 
at least one, one type of fast radio burst couldn't be a, a cataclysmic, the result of a cataclysmic, um, you know, explosion because it repeated. Uh, so, uh, so we found a second one. Uh, we also were able to um, link uh, one fast radio burst back to a galactic magnetar, um, which shows that um, perhaps uh, at least one source of FRBs could be magnetars um, in other galaxies and our own. So, uh, so that was that's a fun uh, that was a fun result too. Uh, Laura, about ten minutes left. Oh no! Okay. Uh, good. Okay. So one thing about uh, so. Uh, this map does not show little tiny galaxies that are very far away. It only shows our galaxy. Um, that is one of our biggest problems, being able to remove the galaxy from our maps, see through it so that we can make a cosmological detection of galaxies at high redshift. So I'm going to skip most of this. The hope, of course, is that um, the, the emission from our own galaxy is smooth across our frequency band, whereas our signal is not because it's uncorrelated galaxies at a lot of different redshifts. And so we should be able to use the frequency, the fact that these don't have the same frequency dependence to remove the smooth frequency emission and only detect the galaxies behind it. In order to do that, we have to calibrate our instrument extremely well. So I'm going to just talk about a couple of ways that we're doing this. Um, so one is we have to understand basically how much amplification our, uh, our instrument has um, every day. And so uh, we have to understand what that's called the gain. So we have to understand our gain quite well. Um, if we make a map of the sky every day and detect how bright a couple of different point sources are in that map uh, and just watch how that number changes over time, we can get a sense of how much our amplification is changing with time. So that's what's shown here in this plot, which um, Seth Siegel made. Um, so across our frequency range, um, you're seeing basically in, in percent how much the brightness of, of, our, of our point sources is changing in the map uh, uh, over time, uh, over uh, 256 days, in fact. So if you just took our raw number from that, you would get the blue line. So you can see that this number would fluctuate from about one to 2% um, over the course of these 200 or so measurements. Um, that's not good enough. Uh, we need to do better than 1% at least. Um, so once we have um, removed the effects of thermal variation. So most of this variation in the one to 2% is actually coming from temperature changes over the course of a day and over the course of the year, et cetera. Uh, so we can correct for that because uh, it's very consistent. So once you've done that correction, you end up with this green line at the bottom, uh, which uh, sort of hovers around a mean of about 0.75% or so, uh, which is close to our actual goal of 0.7% uh, of, uh, um, in amplitude. Um, so we are uh, just from the raw data alone, uh, plus the thermal corrections, we're actually able to get very close already to our uh, goal for, our, for knowing our gain uh, uh, over time well enough to get cosmology out. Our second problem is uh, beams. So uh, I showed you our hot dog shaped beam on the sky. We have to understand uh, either our synthesized beam or that hot dog shaped beam um, very well to be able to remove the foreground power that can leak in if we don't know it well. We have a few different handles um, on how we might be able to constrain uh, uh, the, that, the beam shape. Um, so uh, the different measurements we have are again, point source measurements. So if you just take the map, uh, the same map that I showed from Chime data, ask how bright are all these different, different point sources, um, you can uh, map out basically a, a bit of your north-south beam uh, just from uh, our knowledge of how bright they should be. Um, so that gives you uh, a crosswise selection through our north-south beam, through the hot dog shape. Um, 
we can use measurements from the sun. So the sun is one of the few sources that's extremely bright <laughs> um, and actually moves from north to south during the year. Um, so we can use solar data as well to map out our beam shape. Um, and then finally, another technique that I'll talk about in a second. So one, our first technique is just using these point sources. Um, so if we measure how bright all the point sources are and then divide them by how bright uh, uh, other telescopes have measured them to be, um, we can uh, trace out the shape of our beam along this north-south hot dog. Um, so that's shown in blue is these data points. Um, and uh, we can actually fit a model that's fairly simple. It's based just on if you have a hot dog shaped beam and then a coupled uh, hot dog shaped beam from an adjacent feed, um, how uh, with some time delay, uh, uh, what do you expect your shape along this north south direction to be? Um, and you can, the and, uh, and uh, turns out you can fit a model. It's actually pretty good. It goes through. Um, uh, it goes through the data points uh, very nicely. A couple things about this. One is uh, our beam is not smooth. Uh, so you'll notice uh, uh, this coupling model has a bunch of ripples in it, which are measured in the point sources and expected in the model. Um, so it doesn't look as beautiful as this hot dog shape that I'm showing on the left-hand side. Um, but that structure is well ca captured by actually a fairly straightforward model for, for this. In addition, there's a frequency dependence. So uh, if we measure at 692 megahertz, there's like a dip in the middle of our beam. So uh, somewhere right around zero, there's like a decrement in our, uh, in our hot dog shape. Uh, but if you look at a different frequency, you get a bump instead. Uh, that's also predicted by this coupling model um, and, and well fit by this data. And this is all work by Saurabh Singh. Um, so uh, that gives us some handle on our north-south beam, uh, but unfortunately uh, CHIME alone is not good at measuring point sources because its beam is so big uh, that, uh, that we can't measure the flux from those point sources anywhere other than sort of right overhead. Uh, so if you're interested in the diffraction side lobes um, and things that, uh, you know, show up uh, at uh, Less, you know, less than 10% of our beam, which we are interested in, um, you have to figure out a different way. So these are good for measuring the north-south slice, uh, but are not good for measuring, say, an east-west slice, um, so the orthogonal direction. So one technique uh, to get a handle on that is uh, a measurement we make called holography. So there's a nearby dish right next to Chime uh, that can steer. Um, we, I instrumented it with a 400 to 800 megahertz uh, feed and amplifier set. Um, that signal gets sent over into the CHIME correlator, and that allows us to correlate only what's common between CHIME and this little steerable dish. So we can boost our signal to noise on uh, any given radio source that we're looking at with that steerable dish. Um, so that gives us a really excellent um, measurements in the east-west direction as the source transits. So this is a, a measure, a holography measurement of um, Cygnus A, one of the brightest radio sources in our sky. Um, and you can see you get a nice measurement of the main beam shape, and then these diffraction side lobes out on the side out to plus and minus 15 degrees and even further than that. Um, there's a lot of extra data in here that I'm not going across, going into, um, but there's uh, uh, things like the, the cross polarization and the phase can also be measured using this technique. Um, and these measurements are my graduate student, Alex, and a UBC graduate student, Tristan. Um, I'll skip that. Uh, in addition, so you can do that for many sources. Uh, in addition, there's one other uh, measurement that can give you uh, uh, that gives you actually both north-south along the hot dog and east-west across the hot dog um, uh, uh, beam measurements, and that's the sun. So the sun moves from north, uh, 47 degrees north to south over the course of a year and is super bright, so uh, we can actually pick it up outside of the main beam shape for chime. Um, so this is work by Dallas Wolf um, and shows the complications involved in, uh, in uh, the chime beam shape. So uh, we have all of these diffraction side lobes 
uh, as you cut slices along the hot dog, uh, in addition to a lot of fun, um, uh, a lot of fun structure in the north south direction as well. So this has been uh, a really fruitful way to um, build models for our beam shape um, work by, uh, by uh, Gary Hinshaw and others in particular. And then finally, Chime has access to basically the entire northern sky from its location in, uh, in Canada. Um, but there's a southern part of the sky that uh, has a lot of cosmological surveys, upcoming cosmological surveys in it. Um, so to take advantage of that um, and the much more radio quiet uh, uh, area available in South Africa, we are building HIRACS, the Hydrogen Intensity and Real-Time Analysis Experiment. So um, it will operate in the same frequency range as CHIME, 400, 800 megahertz. So that gives us the redshift range of 0.8 to 2.5. Um, we'll deploy dishes instead of cylinders. So an array of, of 1,024 circular dishes. Um, and it will go in the Karoo Desert in South Africa, basically right next to the Square Kilometer Array Telescope, uh, which means that we'll be very protected from radio frequency interference over the course of the next few decades, uh, basically by, um, uh, by uh, hanging out right next to SKA. Uh, we have a prototype array of eight dishes that are not at the SKA site, but are outside of Johannesburg, where there's a bunch of RFI. Um, but that's been a fun test bed for the different technologies that we've been testing um, for Hyrax. So uh, I started this talk uh, noting that I was going to focus on how to better quantify and understand uh, the accelerated expansion of the history over time um, and what we might learn about dark energy from that. Um, but of course, a measurement of large scale structure gives you a lot of other um, uh, cosmological, uh, interesting cosmological measurements. So we can measure isotropy, uh, we can measure non Gaussianity. Uh, this uh, can give you some estimate of the sum of the neutrino masses um, and then potentially distinguish between, say, modified uh, GR models and dark energy, among other things. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, and that gives you a handle, of course, on all these other fun science goals that we're interested about in cosmology. Um, so I'm going to leave it there, but just have a teaser in case you want to ask me anything about uh, some of my more experimental work uh, and not, not just chime analysis. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, let's virtually clap hands. Um, <laughs> or not virtually. Uh, if you have any question, please raise your hand. Um, it'll be just a bit easier to handle. Uh, Sigurd. Uh, yeah. How much of this uh, beam complexity uh, comes due to having this uh, hybrid between interferometry and uh, normal focusing? Like if you just had an array of normal dishes, would, uh, would the beam be a lot easier in that case? Uh, I sure hope so, yeah. <laughs> um, I think um, uh, much of our beam complexity does come from all of this coupling structure. So um, the fact that even the primary, you know, what, what you might consider the primary beam from a single feed has to get modified by the fact that it can pick up uh, signals from an adjacent feed uh, and even from a few feeds down. So the coupling models that Gary has, uh, has put together and that Sarah has been estimating show we have about 15% coupling with the feed right next door, about 3% coupling to the one, uh, you know, uh, uh, the one after that. And then after that, it's pretty negligible. But that means there's a, a you know, there's a significant amount of power that we have to um, be able to model and understand to, uh, to remove from the beam shape. So the hope would be that with circular dishes that are isolated from each other, you don't have to do, you don't have to do, you know, you don't, you don't have as much of that coupling and you can, uh, you know, you can uh, at least not have those effects. Um, there are going to be other beam effects. You can't get away from those, but, but at least the coupling parts, I think, uh, you know, being able to isolate, physically isolate uh, uh, 
feeds from each other uh, could make it easier. That said, Gary's models are pretty good. Uh, you know, like it's, uh, we're, we're like not at the 0.1% level yet, but, um, but the residuals are getting down to, to more like 3% or so. Um, so, so it seems like it's, it's getting handleable. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Alberta. Hey, Laura, so how much of a concern are the satellite constellations that are being deployed all the all the time? Yeah, um, I so the I um, from the radio side, uh, not too bad so far. Um, our bigger problem is so in Chime. Um, Canada has auctioned off the 400, 800 megahertz band to cell phone companies. So we have actually seen over the course of even the last year, uh, parts of our radio band start getting just, um, you know, removed from RFI. Um, so it's getting worse all the time. Uh, so, so far that I would say that's still our biggest concern, certainly on the chime side. Um, there are ways we could probably handle that through more clever RFI, you know, real-time RFI removal. Um, that's had to be done very well by experiments like LOFAR that operate in way more RFI contaminated areas than we're in. So that's, you know, that's a possibility, but it wasn't something we built directly into the processing. Uh, so, um, so I, you know, I'm not trying to say like Chime can't exist two years from now, but uh, you know, doing more cosmology with Chime 10 years from now will probably require uh, more thought. Um, my impression so far is that the satellite constellations are still a bigger problem for the optical telescopes, uh, but, you know, uh, no one really cares about radio astronomy, so someday uh, that statement will probably not be true anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sigurd has another question. Yeah, I, I wondered if, um... So, so it sounds like these half pipes being close to each other is part of the problem why you get a complicated beam. So would it be easier if they were further away from each other and maybe at different angles to each other? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, further away might be would be good. Uh, that would also allow you to probably add like a, so right now the, the F over, um, right now the feeds are like they're at an f over d of 0.25 for a parabola. So that means they're like sitting just at where the parabola ends, you know, so like the dish comes up and the feed is like right in the middle. Uh, so if you space them a little further apart, um, and even probably now if we really wanted to, you could, um, you know, just like imagine putting a little bit more mesh above it. That wouldn't change the beam shape very much, but might give you a little bit more radiative isolation between, you know, across cylinders. Um, it's still true that our biggest crosstalk is, is coming from, you know, down the cylinder, uh, which is what you would expect. And that, is, you know, we can't do much about. Yeah, uh, okay, I was thinking that uh, it, if it's crosstalk along the cylinder, wouldn't having the cylinder at different angles mean that that shows up in different directions on the sky, which means that uh, sort of the, the, even if it's in the side lobe of, of one cylinder, it wouldn't be for the other one and yeah. disentangle what's in your main beam and what isn't in your main beam. Yeah, and like the equivalent of that is kind of you're at different um, baseline spacings also, so you wouldn't expect it to show up at the same um, place on the sky um, as, you know, as you, if you imagine one is straight and one is an angle, uh, you know, they're different baseline spacings. So you'll yeah. also, uh, you'll measure different modes uh, that you wouldn't expect to be coupled unless it was, uh, unless it was uh, physically uh, coupled. Yeah, we and accidentally, computers, yeah, yes. yeah. Computers yeah. move them a bit further apart. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask one question, Sigurd, um, and then probably we should close it. Um, 
so you, you mentioned that the uh, the cosmological results that, uh, or at least the forecast you showed, are based on the five year survey. I don't know how much you can say, but uh, should we expect a uh, intermediate cosmological result with less than five years uh, of data? Um, our, so uh, something I, I forgot to highlight as much as I should have, our biggest problem isn't data in the can. So like a three-year survey would be totally fine to get excellent cosmology results. Uh, we would, if we were, we're not sitting on them right now because the analysis is hard. So the, we're, um, we're making up most of our analysis as we go. Um, the gain, you know, we're getting close, but it's taken us three years to basically get to the point where we're able to say our gain is nearly where we want it or maybe at where we want it uh, and that our beams are modeled well enough that we might actually be able to start removing some of these effects from the beam maps or from the maps. So um, we're uh, like my guess is that uh, and I don't want to forecast this, but my guess is that if we were sitting at a place where our analysis was really great, we just do it on however much data we'd already taken. Uh, and so whether that was four years or five years, uh, you know, uh, that's, you know, we'd probably process the whole thing unless, unless there was some period of time that was really bad. Also, we probably won't stop at five years. At minimum, the FRB is, you know, the, that, uh, they'll, um, Chime FRB will want to keep going, obviously, because they, they, you know, they don't integrate anything. They're just looking for sources. Um, so we probably won't stop at five years anyway. Um, and those, I should have said, those um, forecasts assumed that we were thermal, um, basically thermally limited, uh, noise limited by our, uh, uh, that we had reached the point where all of our noise was thermal only and not systematics. Um, and so the uh, five years was that we averaged that down enough that our final result was actually cosmic variance limited. Um, we're certainly not at the point right now where we are, uh, you know, where we are um, reaching the thermal noise floor of our noise expectations either for all of the reasons that, that all the calibration, all the stuff about calibration that's hard. Right. Yeah.